Well, good morning. Can you hear me? There we go. Good morning. Glad you could join us for worship today, and I hope that you have uh, a great week ahead. A couple of years ago, we started a journey through the Gospel of Mark, and we did it two summers in a row, and we went all the way through all 16 chapters of Mark, and Pastor Clay ended that message in 2020, that message series in 2020 with uh, Mark chapter 16, uh, verse uh, 7. And I always felt like we had a little unfinished business because there's some more to the gospel of Mark. And so when he called me yesterday and asked if uh, I could uh, preach, I said, sure. And uh, immediately my mind went to, well, let's try to finish that series in Mark. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I ask you to open up your Bible to Mark chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 8 this morning and go to the end of the chapter and uh, some of you might see some red flags in your Bible. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I am one that doesn't like unfinished business. And I always worry about something not being completed. Um, one of my biggest frustrations is to watch TV with my wife on Friday night when we'll watch Dateline or one of those crime shows and you watch it for a whole hour and they say and this guy did this and he probably did this and the evidence said this and then you get to the end of the show and we still don't know if the guy is guilty or not that drives me nuts I'm like why did we even watch this show we still don't know and that drives me crazy uh, years ago uh, you were all probably involved with the video rental uh, business and as you know, uh, there was a very popular chain called Blockbuster Video. And those of, that are, of you that are younger or just used to streaming or you used to DVDs probably don't know much about this, but uh, back in the 80s and 90s and up until about 2014, uh, people rented video cassettes that, that uh, look like this. And uh, you went to this big chain or a local chain called Blockbuster Video, and you got your movie from Blockbuster. And um, uh, as uh, technology progressed and business models changed, Netflix kind of shoved Blockbuster out of business. And uh, you used to have to go and you would get a, a video. And do you remember you had to rewind it before you turned it back in? What was the phrase? Be kind, rewind, and uh, do that. Well. Uh, apparently, uh, I went and got some tapes a while back, and I've, I'm always worried I'm going to get to heaven and they're not going to let me in because I didn't return these four <laughs> video cassettes to Blockbuster before they went out. And so I still have We Are the World, um, a documentary on Woodrow Wilson, another documentary on... Um, James Buchanan, President, and Back to the Future 3. <laughs> so uh, I'm holding on to them just in case Blockbuster opens up again so I can return them, but I'm really kind of dreading that late fee. <laughs> and I also don't know how to rewind these anymore because I don't have one of those little rewind machines anymore. I just, I just that's always going to kind of nag at me, that unfinished business. Personally, I also had some unfinished business when I graduated college. If you'll go in my office and look at my degrees, you will see that one of my degrees is a Bachelor of Music Education, and it's dated uh, Mar uh, in um, sorry um, spring of 1992. And then you'll look at my master's degree, which is dated. Uh, August of 1992. So how did I get a master's degree in three months? I went to Florida State University for my bachelor's degree and I actually finished all of my coursework in 1988. I graduated in 1988 from Florida State. Florida, Florida has some weird rules and years and years ago, I don't know if this is still in place, but there was something called the Gordon Rule in place in Florida. Some senator who was trying to make a name for himself way back when 
uh, said that everybody that went to a public university in Florida, not only did you have to do the coursework for your degree, but you also had to be able to write about 30,000 words in papers and research before you could graduate as well. So what happened was uh, all of your English, English classes were three hours, but they also were worth a certain number of words, like three or four or 5,000 words. Um, and then you could write papers in other courses. Well, my problem was when I went to Florida State, I, uh, I was very proficient in reading and writing. I took one of these tests that exempted me from all of my English classes. I didn't have to take English in um, college, so I didn't take English classes, but I still needed the words. So I went all the way through my degree, walked on the stage, got my uh, little uh, piece of paper, which isn't your degree, shook the guy's hand and walked off and went off to my master's degree and started it at uh, 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 Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. So when I finished my master's degree requirements, I was filling out the paperwork to walk and graduate and get that degree, know, knowing that I'd never received my diploma from Florida State and, and I didn't know why. And so when I was doing the checklist at my master's degree, they said, we still don't have your degree. And we called back to Florida State and they said, oh, you still owe 6,000 words. because of those English classes you never took. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I had to take two more classes in my seminary education that summer and write 6,000 words, send the credits back to Florida State University, and then I could graduate from Florida State, they sent me my degree, and then I could graduate with my master's degree, and I finally got it all taken care of. But Again, unfinished business kind of messes us up. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about that this morning, because if you look in your Bible, some of you will have a Bible, and when it ends, uh, the passage here in Mark chapter 16, verse 8, it says, And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they're afraid. And then in some of you might have a little note in your Bible. I have one even in my Bible app here that says this. Some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, 9 through 20. And for those of you that have that, maybe in some of your translations, you might have always wondered, what about the rest of this chapter? Is it scripture or not? So let's talk about that this morning. First, before we get into the word of God, let me pray. Father, we thank you for the words that you have provided for us through the scriptures to inspire us, to teach us, and to help us to learn. And Father, as we open the passage this morning, may we learn how to apply the truths of Jesus' resurrection and his commission to us to be a part of the work of the kingdom of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you stop at verse 8 in chapter 16, that just seems like a strange place to end. And yes, it is true that some of the earliest manuscripts that we study from, that they have access to, do not have verses 9 through um, 20. And there's a reason for that. And I want to explain what those manuscripts are and why we have that conclusion. And I don't want you to worry about the passage that we're studying this morning not being scripture. Well, here's what they say about this. First of all, there are several manuscripts. One is called the Codex Washington Iamus, I think is how you say it, or the Freer Codex. This is an ancient manuscript that was discovered in Egypt about the 4th century. It was uh, bought and transferred, and it is basically the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it was discovered in about 300 to 400 AD, uh, where, where we know that that was actually written, uh, that these passages written there. And at the end of the Gospel of Mark, it does not contain verses 9 through 20. So that's one of the earliest manuscripts in place that we have. 
There's also an abbreviated ending from uh, the uh, 7th to 9th century A.D. that has about two verses in it. And um, it says... Um, seeing if I wrote it down here. Uh, it says these words, but they, after verse 8, but they briefly reported to Peter and to all of those that had been told. And after this, Jesus himself sent out by means of them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Now that's an abbreviated ending that's found in some of the manuscripts that are from the 7th to 9th century. The other two manuscripts that we know of are called the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex, Codex Sinaiticus. And these are both from about the 4th century AD as well. And what is interesting about these is they do not have verses 9 through 20 in their, um, in the writing. There are actually, these two are reliable because um, we have the complete Bible in Latin trans translated all the way the Old Testament, all the way the New Testament, except for those last few verses of Mark. But in these two actual documents, at the end of Mark, there's a big blank page. And there's not one at the end of Matthew or Luke or John, which indicates to us that the people that were translating knew there was more material, they just didn't have access to it to put it in these two documents as well. What I like to rely on are earlier translations and earlier documentation and earlier evidence. And we have second century quotes from the church fathers, people like Irenaeus and Tatian and Justin Martyr, who lived in the second century within a hundred years or 150 years of Mark being written, who actually quote from Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, which is a little bit more reliable. So just because our earliest manuscripts that the people in the 4th century had access to don't contain these verses, doesn't mean that these are not scripturally accurate and can be the inspired word of God. We have the early church fathers. Church fathers are the disciples of the disciples, basically. And they, they quote these verses in their writings as well. So there is a reliability on studying this passage from scripture that we can ascertain today. And I'm just going to use a quick little outline here. Here's what we can learn from verses 9 through 20. And it is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We learn about Jesus' resurrection. We get a commission, the great commission from Jesus. It's worded a little bit differently than what we get in Matthew. It is about Jesus' ascension and the operation of Jesus, Jesus' work. What are we to do? What's Jesus doing and what are we doing? And that's what we want to look at this morning as we go through these verses. So let's, uh, let's read these verses here starting in verse 9. First we hear about the resurrection here. Uh, it's continuing what's uh, listed, the, the story earlier about the angel and the ladies coming but here's what it is. Verse 9. When he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and he had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Here was the first appearance of Jesus Christ. And he appears to Mary Magdalene, and he says, go and tell him, and go, go tell Peter. And we have this account in the other Gospels where uh, she went back, and Peter and John run to the tomb, and they, they find that the tomb is empty as well, and they see the grave claws are, are laying there as well. But in this passage here, what we hear at first is nobody believed. You know, it would have been nice if uh, whoever... Uh, was dictating these words and just added this word in here that um, she went and told all of them who had been with him as they mourned and wept and they were so excited to hear that Jesus was alive. But that's not what it says. It says that they did not believe. They were skeptical. 
which to me gives more credence to the resurrection of Jesus being a true fact than anything else. And here's why. First of all, in the first century, I'm not trying to be male chauvinist here. This is not the belief of Randall Floyd. This is what first century Judaism believed. Women's testimony is not true. It's gossip. So they wouldn't believe Mary because she was a woman. A woman could not speak in a Jewish court of law. And even early writers of Greek would, would uh, scoff at some of the resurrection stories because the first people to report the resurrection was a group of women. To me, that adds credence because if you really wanted to make up a story about a resurrection, you would want it to be as firm in place as possible and you wouldn't have said women saw him first. So the fact that the gospel writers promote the truth and say the women saw the angel, the women saw Jesus first, actually gives credence to this story being true. But, the disciples don't believe. They're still grieving, which tells me they're all not ready to hear about a resurrection yet. They're still focused on the death of Jesus, and they're not ready to hear about a resurrection. But the case is Jesus is alive. And then he goes on, and we keep reading through this, and we read the next verses here in verse 12. After these things, he, Jesus, appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country and they went back and they told the rest but they didn't believe them either what are we talking about here this these are the two disciples that jesus appeared to on the emmaus road that we read about in the other gospels we know that jesus appeared it says he didn't appear in uh he appeared in another form or another likeness they just didn't recognize him is what that actually means that that Jesus appears to two of the disciples and they're told to go back and tell the rest of the disciples that Jesus is alive. Still, they do not believe. Which brings us to our next part here. And Jesus appears to the eleven themselves, verse 14, as they were reclining at the table. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. So we've got a depiction in Mark's gospel here, just like in the other gospels, of Jesus rising from his own power from the dead. A resurrection, a miraculous, powerful thing has just happened that gives all of us hope and gives all of us the freedom from our sin because Jesus paid for our sins by dying on the cross and then proved he was who he said he was, that he was the Messiah, that he did pay for our sins, that he was God by rising from his own power after three days and appearing to those and giving many proofs. So we have the evidence to support a resurrection, but that still gives us a problem because there's an empty tomb there. If you've ever been skeptical about the resurrection of Jesus in the empty tomb like I have, people are not always just going to accept that somebody rose from the dead. I mean, if you tell somebody that somebody rose from the dead, that just sounds ridiculous. Nobody rises from the dead. Nobody comes back. I know there are zombie movies, okay? <laughs> Those are fake, just so you know. So if you're walking around at night in Halloween and you're worried about zombies, don't, Okay. But if you tell somebody somebody rose from the dead, you're going to get a skeptical attitude from just about everybody that's got a brain. I didn't believe that as a young person, and I began to investigate that. How could somebody rise from the dead? How could he be alive? And it's one of the things that is part of my testimony where I discovered all of this evidence that actually supports the resurrection of Jesus more than it makes me doubt the resurrection of Jesus. It's one of the most sure facts you can discover in history, through literature, through witness accounts, through archaeology, through prophecy. There are so many things, but one of them is the, the, the tomb. And this is a problem for a lot of people. And Pastor Clay alluded to this when he was doing this sermon, but I just want to remind you that there are several theories out there that 
try to tell you, well, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. There was, there was a, there's a logical explanation for it. The first is the stolen body theory, that the disciples or the Jews went and took the body of Jesus and they hid it, and then they told everybody that uh, he was resurrected. Well, the problem with the disciples is, you read these accounts, they're scared and they're hiding and they're grieving. They're not ready for a resurrection. They're certainly not plotting to figure out how do we go get the body? How do we get past these Roman guards, which depending on which history book about Roman history you read, could have been between four and 20 guards at that tomb. And did you know that if the guards had left the tomb or fallen asleep and been caught, that they would have to give up their own life for not carrying out their duty? It was a rough job if they left their duty. So the disciples would have had to do this, plot this out, figure it out, get past the, them, get the stone out of the way, find the body, get the body out of there and hide it. That just didn't happen. So a lot of people think the Jews want to do that. But it, why would the Jews want to have the body of Jesus and say he's resurrected too? Because everybody that was proclaiming as the church grew that Jesus was alive, all they had to do was then go say, no, he's not alive, here's his body. We have it right here. So the disciples didn't steal the body and the Jews didn't steal the body. That just doesn't make sense. There's another theory called the swoon theory. The swoon theory is basically saying that Jesus, after he was emasculated by whipping and so tired and so worn out that he couldn't even carry his cross to his execution, and that he had been crucified and bled and thirst and his body just gave out and when he gave up the ghost that he really didn't die yet that they just took him into a cool place in the tomb and there he was able to recover enough from that unwrap himself from the burial linens push that stone out of the way and then take a walk he felt that, be that much better. Man, if that was medical treatment today, all of us would be great. Okay? Every time I got sick or a broken arm or something, I'd just go lay down in a tomb somewhere and get better. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Who needs health care insurance when we could just do that? So the swoon theory doesn't really make sense either. Jesus' Jesus's death and crucifixion is well documented. And archaeological, as well as other evidence, such as the Shroud of Turin and the other shroud of his head, head wrappings, correlate the exact story that we're hearing. It, it, there's a lot of evidence that corroborates that Jesus died and rose again. So the swoon theory doesn't really work out. There's another one that's called the wrong tomb theory. And that's this, that the women got up so early, it was dark, they were crying, it was foggy, and they went to the wrong tomb. And so they went in that wrong tomb. The problem with that is that then when the disciples ran to the tomb, they also ran to the wrong tomb. And Joseph of Arimathea, whose tomb it was, couldn't find his own tomb. And uh, the other problem with that is there was an angel there. There was an angel there guarding the wrong tomb. You see, all of this just doesn't make sense. The wrong tomb theory just doesn't make sense either. And there's another theory that says it was just a big hallucination. All of the disciples and those women were hallucinating that they saw Jesus alive. And the, the passage in 1 Corinthians where Paul says that, that Jesus appeared to the eleven and to James, his brother, and to over 500 witnesses. They were all just hallucinating. Psychologists tell us that you don't, you don't hallucinate in groups. Groups don't hallucinate. Uh, so that really doesn't play out. So what does that leave us with? It leaves us with this. The best conclusion, once you apply the, all these arguments, is that Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection is true. It's a fact. Go and explore that. Go look into that. If you're skeptical of Jesus rising from the dead and that there was something wrong with the, all these theories, there's plenty of evidence to undergird that Jesus rose from the dead in addition to your faith in that. That's what I discovered. Plus all the disciples, they all went to their, their death saying Jesus rose from the dead. All of the disciples except for John 
were killed for saying that Jesus rose from the dead and they had good news. At any of those points where they were about to be um, killed with a sword or crucified upside down or crucified or, or, or dragged or beaten or thrown some, from somewhere, all of these people could have said, oh, we were just kidding. <laughs> we made it all up. None of them did. None of them recounted. Recan- recanted is the word. None of them said that we made this up. It's a fictional thing. So it's easy for us to try to poke holes in it. But if you dig a little bit more, it's really hard to prove that the resurrection did not happen. It did. It's a fact. So we get the resurrection. Let's move on in our verses here um, to the next part here. So here in verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all of creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is Mark's version of the Great Commission. And it's not the one we preach about a whole lot. We like the one in Matthew a whole lot that says, go into all the world and preach the gospel and uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And we like that one. That one's easy to remember. That one sounds a little more clean. This one sounds scary, doesn't it? So why does it say this? He said to them, go into all of the world and proclaim the good good news to the whole of creation. Everybody in the whole world, no matter who you are, no matter what gender you are, no matter what race you are, no matter what country you live in or region of the world you live in, no matter what age you are, you need to hear this good news because the good news is for all people everywhere. It's always been about sharing the good news that Jesus paid for your sins and he is alive, proving that he paid for your sins and he offers you hope and salvation and a place and a future. That's the good news that we're to go and proclaim. So why does it say in these next verses about uh, baptism? Well, let's talk about that. It's not saying whoever believes and is baptized will be saved and whoever does not believe will be condemned in verse 16. This is not saying that you have to be baptized to be saved. There's a lot of people that point to this verse and they point to Peter's sermon in here when they, they said in Acts, when they said, what do we have to do to be saved? And Peter just says, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. So a lot of people think that you have to be baptized. In fact, a lot of different denominations practice something called child or infant baptism. You know, you go to the Catholic Church, they do some of this. They, they do a blessing and they do infant baptism. Greek Orthodox baptize infants face forward three times. Probably why there's not so many Greek Orthodox, I'm assuming. I, I don't know. They, they, just, they do these little baptisms because they think that if you have to be baptized that that will save your soul and you'll be able to go to heaven. But that's not what this verse is saying, that you have to be baptized. He's saying, repent and be baptized. Peter is. And this is saying, whoever does what? Believes and is baptized will be saved. Baptism follows the belief. It's something that is a reinforcement of what your belief is okay so I don't know how how some of you grew up I've heard about people I didn't get this if if you were a student in school and you got good grades you would get money do you do you remember that I remember talking to my friends and they came home and said all right I'm getting five dollars for every A and I'm like how do you do that I went home and told my parents and they laughed at me (laughs) what do you mean you want five dollars for your A's Uh, You know, so does that mean if I give you money, then you're going to get an A? No. It means that because you got an A, you get the money. Okay? If you uh, see somebody that gets a reward, uh, an award for being heroic, 
okay? As opposed to the cowardly lion and the Wizard of Oz, you know? He got, what did he get? A medal of courage, and then that made him courageous, but we had already discovered he was already courageous. He got the award because he was courageous. The war didn't make him have courage or brave, and the award for a medal of honor doesn't give you the honor. You've already earned that honor, and the award is the repercussions and the consequence and the reward for the belief or what have you done. That's what baptism is. The baptism is an action following what your belief is. We repent, we believe, and then we are baptized. And I would encourage you, if you have not been baptized and you believe, that you should follow through on this command. Jesus gives it as a command because if you can't follow that command, how are you going to follow any of the others? Getting baptized is pretty easy. And some people will say, well, we, we can't do it. I, I, I have some kind of type of handicap or some physical ailment or some type of fear of water. We can work with that. We've done private baptismal ceremonies. We've done it in very, very shallow water. We've seen baptisms in bathtubs. We can work on We can immerse you in, like baptism says, we can help you do that. The responsibility is to follow through with your belief. Baptism needs to be something public. That's why we have it here in a public service. You know, when we, when we hopefully get our, our outdoor chapel uh, built, and I hope we will, I, I would encourage us to have some outdoor baptismal services outside and, and make them public for people. Um, the North Carolina uh, Baptists recommend whenever a church is building a new church, they, they recommend building a church with a baptism with big glass windows in front of the baptism. So people driving by will actually see people getting baptized. Make it public. They've been encouraging different things like that. I, I think we should do that. That baptism is a public expression of a personal faith. So follow through in baptism. And Jesus tells us that if you will believe, then you will go forth and be baptized. But then he talks about this other stuff. Uh, these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. Casting out demons. Well, we've seen Jesus and the disciples do that in the Gospels. So they know, we know that's possible. It also says, uh, in my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will be able to speak in new languages. We see that happening with the coming of the Holy Spirit. And people are able to understand them. But then he says, they'll pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. So uh, has anybody ever been to a snake handling church in the South? They are, there are some churches that do that. They, they get a box and they put a rattlesnake or something in it, and they, they pass the snake around. Anybody want to volunteer for that this morning? That works from that way? Me either. I mean, if you come at, come at me with a snake, I'm out of there. You know, let me just say this. I hate snakes. If I had been Eve, you would still be perfect. <laughs> because I would never have gone anywhere near the snake. Okay? So, you know, so, so what's this about? And what's this about the poison? It says if. It doesn't say Go. It says, if they do this and if they do that. These, I believe, are the conditions that the early apostles faced after Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven. And they had to go out into dangerous areas. And could it have been the conditions of travel or the conditions of persecution that they were going to face against? That deadly force would be used against them. And that Jesus is saying, if you go out and you face these deadly conditions, you will be protected. Now, God can always do whatever he wants to do. And we, we don't really have evidence from Scripture about the poison issue, but we do have evidence of Scripture of the snake issue. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked on the island, and as he was moving driftwood, he was bitten by a very poisonous snake, and he did not get sick, and he did not die. And here we see something like that referred to in Mark's gospel. I think this is really more about the conditions that the apostles were about to face as they went out, and that miracles did take place during the apostolic age, which was until about A.D. 70, we know. But let me just say this for those people and 
those that think this is something you need to go practice, that you need to go get a snake or you need to drink poison or you need to do some of this stuff just to prove your faith. You're falling into the same trap that Satan wanted to set for Jesus when he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, cast yourself down and you'll be saved. In other words, make a big show so everybody will believe. Tempt God so that you can believe. We don't want to fall into that trap. We don't want to make a big show about salvation. We just want to share the truth of salvation. So it, you can go home. Uh, I hope, encourage today that you don't have to go home and pick up snakes to worship God or drink poison to, to worship God and so forth. And it also says they'll lay hands upon people and they will get well. And we have documentation of that in the book of Acts and the early church that people got well during that apostolic age. Well, that brings us to what's next here in verse 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven. This is the ascension of Jesus. And here's where he goes. He takes the disciples up to a hill and he gives them these final words and then he ascends into heaven, something only Jesus can do. I know you've probably seen the Superman movie where Superman flies up into heaven. Jesus is not being Superman here. Jesus is being the Messiah, the Savior, and a part of the Trinity. He is our God. And so he is able to ascend into heaven. And why did he go to heaven? It says here in the next part of that verse there, the end of chapter 16, verse 19, he was taken up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. Why does Jesus sit down? To me, and to most of us, sitting down sounds like something you do when um, you're just resting. This brings up an interesting, an interesting idea about Jesus. What was Jesus doing during the Old Testament? Was he just kind of mm, waiting? Dad, put me in. Let me go. Come on. Is now? Now? Was he doing that? And then what, was Je what is Jesus doing now that he's already done the work on earth? Is Jesus just done and sitting there twiddling his thumbs waiting to come back again? No, he's not. Jesus has always been working. There's two pictures here that you can paint from Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. The right hand is a place of honor. And when a priest was finished with their temple duties, that is when they sat down. Jesus completed his work of salvation and then he is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's a priest. A rabbi, when a rabbi taught, they sat down. Everybody else stood. A rabbi sat down to teach. Jesus is still teaching and he is still conversing with God the Father right next to him about us. He is still working. He is still doing work. He, we'll get into the Old Testament thing later. I've got, a, got another message for you on that one coming at Christmas. But Jesus has always been working throughout the Old Testament, throughout all of history, even on his several years here on earth, and he is still working since he has ascended into heaven until he comes back again, and he will be working still with us. He is always praying for us. He is always working for us. He is preparing a place for all of us who call upon his name just like he promised he would and we have a picture of him sitting at the right hand of the father with his completed work as priest and his teaching work as rabbi and that picture is indicated here in mark's gospel and then we need to follow through with jesus's operation the work that we have here it's for us he's already given us a great commission and here's what the apostles did in verse 20 they went out and they preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the accompanying signs. Jesus' operation is working with us, all of us who follow Jesus. What does that mean? When we follow Christ, we have been commissioned, a co-mission. We don't have to go by ourselves. He goes with us. He works with us. We have a job to do. What's that job? That job is to share Jesus Christ with every person possible that we can. And we share it with our prayers. We share it with our giving. We share it with our going. 
we share it with our words, we share it with our actions. We continually share the good news of Jesus Christ as followers of Christ because that is what he has asked us to do and he is still working with us every step of the way. Maybe you're a skeptic. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus. I encourage you to follow Jesus. He is who he said he was. He, he proved he, who he said he was. And he wants to give you a life right now and a job right now and an eternity in a relationship with him of hope. What's heaven? Heaven is you at your best with everybody else at their best in a relationship working with Jesus that never ends forever. That's what heaven is. I'm going. I hope you're going to go. I would love to have you go too if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ. We'd love to tell you about that more. So let me close this out with a word of prayer and ask our musicians to come forward. Father, thank you for these words from Scripture which teach us of Jesus' work on the cross, his resurrection from the tomb, and the commission that he gives us today, seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. Father, if there are those here this morning who don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, I ask that they would search their hearts and they would be open to becoming a learner and a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, I invite you to just say these words to God, to yourself. God, I know that you love me and I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins and pay for them. So I confess that I'm a sinner and I ask Jesus to come into my life and erase all of my transgressions. And I will now follow Jesus and give him control as the Lord and the boss and the controller of my life. And I will faithfully follow him with the job that he has for me in this earth and experience the wonders and the riches of the promise of eternal life in heaven. If you prayed those words and you're watching online, please contact us. We have some follow-up uh, information we'd love to send to you. If you're here this morning and you prayed those words, following the service, I'll be in the Welcome Center and we'd love to talk with you some more about what's next in following Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Father, hear our prayer. Accept our worship. Lead us and guide us as we leave this sanctuary building today and we go into all of creation and preach and share the gospel with everyone that we can, just as you commanded. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship.